Thank you everyone for subscribing to Infinitely Productions. If it is you have not done so, please click the bell and subscribe, and we hope you enjoy our content. Our fine. So let's pay a fine. I admire, but the other boys that are going to be indicted with you, you're giving them criminal records, and you're giving yourself a criminal record. What's a thousand dollar fine? Pay it. A year later, he was indicted again, this time in Saratoga Springs. Again, he avoided testifying by pleading guilty. This time, a fine wouldn't be enough. Lansky spent three months in the county jail. Released in August 1953, he decided it was time to take his gambling racket out of the country. He went south, all the way to Cuba, where gambling was legal and mobsters were welcome. And in 1953, Cuba needed Lansky just as much as he needed a safe haven. Lansky had been dabbling in Cuban gambling for years, but now the Havana tourist industry was threatened by scandal. Many of the casinos were exposed as using doctored games to cheat tourists. To restore international faith in the Cuban casinos, President Fulgencio Batista turned to the one man whose reputation for running a fair game was impeccable, Meyer Lansky, and offered him a job as gambling czar. The little man took the job with gusto and told the other casino operators, clean up or get out. With Lansky at the helm, Cuban tourism exploded. Lansky invited his mafia pals to invest, and many did. The Americans were pouring in there, other nationalities were pouring in there. Uh, Meyer made a fortune. Lansky made sure he stayed in the good graces of President Batista. I know that every time Meyer went to Cuba, he would bring a briefcase with at least $100,000. So Batista welcomed him with open arms. And the two men had such an affection for each other. Batista really loved them. I don't because he brought I guess I'd love them too. He gave me $100,000 every time he saw me. Lansky rented a third home in Havana. He ran one major casino of his own, the Nacional. There he resumed his traditional role, the quiet commander, pacing the casino floor and watching the dollars roll in. And you could almost get the sense of people turning and, and looking and knowing who he was and not saying anything to him, but sort of like the Red Seas party. People don't have to tell you, you just, you know, who, who's who. And he was somebody. At the Nacional, Lansky was fussed over by the staff, including waiter Jorge Fernandez, and constantly protected by a team of bodyguards. They would be reading the Havana Post, a newspaper printed here in Cuba. But across their laps, they had a little Smith & Wesson, a little revolver you could not see. It was in case someone should make an attempt on the life of Meyer Lansky. That was who they were protecting. Cuba looked like a sure thing. So in 1956, the man who warned his own friends not to gamble placed his biggest wager yet. He pulled all this money together to actually invest further, reinvest, like the good businessman, uh, in this wonderful hotel, the Riviera. Uh, which was in its day and remains the best hotel in Cuba, the most comfortable, the first one with central air conditioning instead of all those little boxes in the windows dripping water down. Lansky began spending more of his time in Cuba, away from the grip of American investigators. But even the mafia tycoon couldn't stay out of the law's clutches forever. In October 1957, New York mob boss Albert Anastasia was murdered in a Manhattan barbershop. New York police knew that before his death, Anastasia had been looking to invest in Cuban casinos. So they wanted to question Meyer Lansky. Learning that Lansky was making a short trip to New York, the police pounced. Lansky was arrested and questioned about Anastasia. He denied any knowledge of the murder. We couldn't tell him anything. We know nothing about it. It was just as foreign to me as it would be to an Eskimo in Alaska. As an excuse for questioning Lansky, the police charged him with vagrancy, a technicality that the millionaire found especially offensive. Uh, do you pay taxes in the United States? Oh, yes. Very dearly. But I'm a vagrant. The police put a tail on Lansky. Detective William Graff settled down in the lobby of Lansky's hotel. Within minutes, Lansky approached the cop. He said he wanted to confess to a problem. I know he was playing with me. I had no two ways about it. And I finally said, I can't get good chickens in Cuba. 
I said, what? Good chickens in Cuba? And then he explained that uh, he uh, had a problem getting chickens to, uh, to feed his guests at the, uh, at the hotel. The poultry shortage did not stop the Riviera Hotel from being a huge success. Lansky's gamble was paying off. He spared no expense because here he was, legitimate, and could see this whole world of Caribbean tourism uh, expanding. What he didn't reckon on were the guys with beards in the hills. For three years, Fidel Castro and his ragged army of revolutionaries had been running raids on Batista's military from their hideouts in the mountains. On New Year's Eve 1958, just one year after the Riviera opened, Castro's forces took control of Cuba's major cities. Batista fled. The next day, Castro entered Havana. Rebel troops took over the casinos, including the Riviera. In January, when my wife and I went there at the, the Riviera Hotel, there were Castro's men sleeping in the hallways, making a barracks out of it. These filthy soldiers with their beards, and it's just pathetic. And that's, I think that hastened Meyer's uh, illness because he had a heart condition and a stomach condition. A year after the revolution, Castro banned gambling and declared the casino hotels the property of the government. Once again, Lansky was out of business. He had sunk almost his entire fortune into the Riviera Hotel, only to have it taken away gangster style at gunpoint. Now, the mob tycoon was going to have to find a new way to make his millions back. After Fidel Castro took over Cuba and evicted the American gangsters from their casinos, Meyer Lansky was at the lowest point of his career. Gone were the millions he had invested in the Havana Riviera Hotel. While he was delighted by the arrival of his first grandchild, respectfully named Meyer II by Lansky's son Paul, his health was deteriorating. In 1962, he suffered a serious heart attack. Worse, Lansky had now become a target in a clandestine FBI operation. Unauthorized bugs were installed in the homes of leading mobsters around the country, including Lansky's new ranch house near Miami. One night, the agents overheard Lansky remark to his wife that organized crime was, quote, bigger than U.S. steel. That was precisely what the Fed suspected. They saw Lansky as the chief financial officer of a vast secret mob corporation. Other wiretaps seemed to support that impression, especially the surveillance of a New Jersey mobster named Anthony Jip DiCarlo. On tape, DiCarlo boasted that Lansky had reopened his connections to Nevada gambling, was heavily involved in skimming profits from Las Vegas casinos, and was once again making millions. But Meyer was still safe from arrest. Since the bugs were unauthorized, the feds couldn't use the evidence against the mob tycoon. The FBI had to watch as Lansky went about his... Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to our channel and check out more of our content. Feel free to give your feedback and suggestions on what we should do next in the comments. This is Infinite Lee Productions. We love ya.